All right. Welcome to another of these uh, Stoic Sunday sessions, uh, officially titled Stoic Philosophy and Practice the Basics. Uh, a while back, I decided to start doing some sessions where we would do a bit of a, a deeper dive into classic Stoic ideas, looking at them in uh, some of the, the key Stoic texts and, you know, getting getting clear about what the Stoics actually did think and teach and do when it comes to really key ideas. And I began with uh, the virtues. We had a session that was specifically about all four of the cardinal virtues and how they include a lot more and, and why those particular virtues. And then we've done special sessions on each of those four cardinal virtues until this one uh, today, where we are wrapping up this, you could call it sequence, with looking at the fourth of the cardinal or key or whatever you want to call them, major virtues. And we've looked at wisdom, justice, courage, already. Now we're going to be looking at one that we can translate as temperance or moderation, self-control. I've, I've seen other things as well. Self-restraint is a definition. People have all sorts of ways of translating this in English. And by the way, it wasn't completely consistent in the Greek or the Latin either, as we'll, we'll talk about. And I think that to start with, this is this is a virtue that often gets short shrift, right? It's it's viewed as one that's kind of boring by a lot of people. You know, it's courage that's very flashy and justice. Oh, that's the social temperament and wisdom. It's you know the one that unites all the virtues together. Temperance, well, it has to do with you know the appetites and keeping things in control and within limits. And and there's a kind of boringness perhaps uh, in, in a lot of people's minds, not in the actual virtue, but in a lot of people's minds. And then on the other side, there are people who seemingly want to reduce stoicism to temperance. You know, they don't, they don't think a lot. They don't talk a lot about the other three virtues and they're into, you know, cold showers and voluntary discomfort and, you know, just being very restrained and stuff like that. And, you know, you should think none of the stoic virtues work in a vacuum. So just being temperate for its own sake is kind of losing sight of what temperance is really about. So there's a lot for us to look at. I'm going to be referencing a number of key Stoic texts. Um, in particular, you know, we've got the three big Stoic philosophers. I'm really only going to be talking mostly about one of them, although you can find lots of important discussions of things connected with temperance in Epictetus and in Marcus Aurelius. I'll, I'll be talking about Seneca, but I'm really going to be focusing much more on um, two really important expositions of Stoic philosophy, both by non-Stoics. One, Arius Didymus's Epitome of Stoic Ethics. The other, Diogenes Laertes, um, Lives of the Philosophers, The Life of Zeno, contained in Book 7. And then some stuff from Cicero, and also some stuff from uh, Musonius Rufus, Epictetus's teacher, who I think doesn't get as much love as, as he could use, right? And so we're going to look at what they have to say about temperance and how we could apply that in our own life. Uh, you know, I'm going to talk for maybe 20, 25 minutes. You can write questions in there if you want to. I, I will probably not pause to answer questions unless it's something super, super relevant and pressing. Um, but we'll, we'll definitely have plenty of time for Q&A and discussion at the end. And before we start looking at what the texts say, there, there is something, there's a few other things I want to say about temperance as a virtue. One of these is something I probably should have said at the very beginning of each of the sessions. And it's, it's this, all these virtues, the Stoics didn't come up with these in a vacuum right? The Stoics are kind of Johnny come lately on the scenes when it comes to schools of philosophy. In fact, you know, Zeno himself is drawing upon the cynics. 
and the Platonists and the Megarians, and then developing his own synthesis. The Stoics um, articulate their philosophy in part in contrast to the Epicureans, but the Aristotelians and some others as well. And everybody had been talking about virtues for centuries before the Stoics come on the scene, right? So, you know, there's the recognition and you could say depiction and advocation of temperance in Mediterranean and, and Near Eastern culture going back centuries, um, not necessarily millennia. It kind of depends on the text that we're looking at. And so, you know, there's a recognition that you need to remain within limits. You might think about the Delphic maxim, you know, made in again, you know, no, nothing too much that that kind of figures into that. And there's also some explicit analysis of what temperance is within pre-Stoic philosophical traditions. Um, not only, you know, I think people who know their philosophy would like to think of Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics Book 3, um, and also, you know, Plato's discussion, for example, in The Republic, Book 4, as well as other places. But, you know, we know from the lives of the philosophers that this was important for the, the cynics, this was important for others. The Epicureans talk about temperance as well. So the Stoics are stepping into a conversation that's been going on for a long time. Another thing that I do want to point out is that the typical treatment of temperance, and if we take Aristotle as like a paradigm for that, um, it has to do with appetites and or desires for pleasant things, the epithumiae in, in Greek, right? And an aversion to a lack of pleasure, being sometimes uh, addicted to pleasures or not being able to do without them. Um, and, you know, the paradigm cases for Aristotle are food, right? And, and eating too much, eating the too rich of a kind of food. Um, he says drink, wine, right? But he, he's really got in mind intoxicants. So we could, you know, in our culture, think about uh, other kinds of alcoholic beverages. We could think about marijuana. We could think about other intoxicants. And then for the Greeks, majorly important sex, right? Sexuality. But we could also think about what you know, uh, Plato and Aristotle talk about as entertainments, you know, things that we look at, like, you know, wa binge watching Netflix. We could think about um, the clothing that we wear, you know, is it, is, do we need it to be really nice? Or do we need it to be fashionable? And we could go on and on and on about other things that we can um, be, you know, captivated by, addicted by, you know, as Mark says, um, indulgence is a word that we can use here, things that we can become self-indulgent with. And this is something, uh, th here's a third point before we begin. We live in a time when, you know, it, it, there is a tendency, given all the other crappy things in our life, the things that we don't like, which from a stoic perspective might be indifference, but, you know, perhaps are affecting us, to use pleasure as a kind of compensation, you know, um, we, we often call it self-care. Oh, I'm going to like have, you know, think about the prototypical thing in movies where somebody's had a bad day and they come home and they get out the tub of ice cream. And instead of like spooning out a reasonable amount into a dish and then eating that, they're sitting on the floor eating the whole half gallon or gallon of ice cream, right? Uh, that would be an example of the sort of thing that we're, we're sometimes prone to. And we say, oh, I've earned this, right? And so this is all, you know, kind of within, oh, Mark talks about something, it's called retail therapy. Yeah, people do this with uh, purchasing. And it's interesting because temperance also extends to wealth uh, in, in some respects, uh, at least for the, the Stoics. So um, let's start with a, a passage from Seneca's On the Happy Life. He says, occasional experiments of our moderation give us the best proof of our firmness and virtue. A well-governed appetite is a great part of freedom, and it is a blessed lot since no person can have all the things that they would have. We may, all of us, forbear desiring what we have not. It is the office, the purpose of temperance 
to overrule us in our pleasures. Some she rejects, others she qualifies and keeps within bounds. I think this is a sort of typical portrayal of temperance, right? And this goes to the thing I was talking about a little bit earlier, the boringness, right? It's it, Temperance is kind of a check on us. It says, no, no, you can't have that. And this, you can have a little bit as a treat, as the meme goes, right? Uh, it's okay for you to have a little bit of drinking, but, you know, maybe you have to stop at two beers. Or you can have that, that tasty food over there, but only a limited amount. And, and, you know, when we look at some of the general discussions of the four virtues, um, I think this also bears this out to some extent. Seneca in you know, the famous letter 120 tells us about the virtues, uh, the desires had to be reined in, fear to be suppressed, proper actions to be arranged, debts to be paid. They, we therefore included self-restraint or temperance, bravery, prudence, and justice, assigning to each quality its special function. So once again, we see you know, desires had to be reined in because otherwise they're going to go crazy, right? Um, Arius Didymus tells us that uh, pr practical wisdom deals with appropriate acts. Self-restraint deals with a person's impulses, right? So again, we see temperance has to do with desires and impulses. Cicero in On Duties, book one, tells us all that is morally right arises from some one of four sources. It is concerned with, and then he goes through it. And then when he gets to temperance, he says this. The orderless, orderliness and moderation of everything that is said and done, wherein consist temperance and self-control. So again, you know, with that one, though, we, we see a different element being introduced. It's not just about restriction. It's not just about you don't get to do what you want, you know, smacking the don't do that, uh, you know, sort of self-restraint. Now it's about something that I think Cicero really is good at bringing to the table, orderliness and moderation of everything that's said and done. He, later he's going to talk about a kind of harmonization taking place as well. So that's, you know, general discussions. And now I want to get into something else that we haven't explored that much in some of these other virtues. We did with courage to a certain extent. Arius Didymus has an has a analysis of the emotions that is quite good. And we can supplement this with Seneca. We can supplement this to some degree with, with passages from, say, Epictetus um, and you know, other texts as well. Um, he tells us that we've got epithumia or appetite is how he translated. It's often translated as desire, one of the four basic passions of the soul. And he tells us that it's a desire, orexis in Greek, that does not listen to or obey reason. The Greek is much more simple, a pethe logo. Pethe is to listen to, but it also has the connotation of obeying. And so what this means is that this, this large category of emotion, desire or appetite, has a cognitive aspect to it. And it forms the opinion or the judgment in Greek, doxadzein, um, you know, the word that we get doxa from, uh, you know, which, which we often see translated in Stoic texts as not just opinion, but judgment. The opinion or judgment that something is good. So when we think rightly or wrongly that something is good, our desire reaches out to it. And, you know, if we, so think about, for example, um, our, our sexual desire, which is something, you know, rooted in nature, but certainly culturally formed. You walk through a supermarket, you get up to the front and all the, you know, magazines are there showing people scantily clad, you know, how, how to get your beach body and stuff like that. And you're like, oh, that person's good looking. Your desire is reaching out to this imaginary person who's been photoshopped and you don't even know from Adam, right? Uh, or, you know, think about food commercials. You see something and you're like, oh, that looks good. Yeah, that's your epithumia reaching out towards it. Now, for the Stoics, desire, as uh, Arius tells us, includes anger and its different varieties. And that, that's a whole different interesting topic, but they do distinguish between different things. Then he talks about cases of erotic love, violent cases of erotic loves, cravings, pothos, which is actually also translated as Greek or as, as grief in other texts, yearnings, and then all these philia, 
fondness for pleasure, philodenai, right? Philos means sort of friendship or, or affinity towards. So uh, philhedonai is, is affinity for pleasure. We, we like pleasant things. Fondness for wealth, fondness for esteem or reputation, philodoxia, right? And then, so that's one category, right? And then he talks about pleasure, hedone, another one of the really basic emotions for the Stoics. And he calls this an elation of the soul that does not listen to or obey reason. This also has a cognitive aspect. It says a good is present. It thinks that things are good in response to which it is appropriate. And the word there is very interesting. Katheke, which is the same word that we get appropriate actions or duties from, the kathekon. And it says that it's, it's, it's appropriate to be elated, to enjoy, to, to do that sort of thing. And very interestingly, Arius only discusses three examples of this. He talks about joy at others' misfortunes, common problem, right? Uh, gratification in the unexpected, and then what gets translated as charlatanry, which I think is a bad translation, pleasure in visual deception. And you could think of it as pleasure in deceiving others, but also pleasure in being deceived. Now, Diogenes Laertes adds to this by telling us that it also includes what, what gets translated as ravishness, ravishment, uh, kelesis, pleasure charming the ear. Think about how much enjoyment we get out of, you know, music. Delight, terpsis, the mind's propulsion to weakness, he calls it. And then transport, diachusis, unbinding or the, the, you know, the breaking down of, of virtue. And you might say, well, that's, that's all very interesting. What the hell does this have to do with temperance? Well, these are all forms of pleasure or desire that temperance would bear upon and either rule out or limit or wean us away from. And you might say, well, what about the other? I know that the Stoics had like a four-part emotion classification. What about the other parts? And the answer to that is, well, that has to do with courage. There's like a, a sharing of responsibilities, you could say, between courage and temperance. In On the Happy Life, Seneca tells us, as the body is to be kept in on the downhill and forced upwards, there's some virtues that require the rein, pulling back, and some that require the spur, right? Um, in liberality, temperance, gentleness of nature, we are to check ourselves for fear of falling. But in patience, resolutions, and perseverance, where we're to mount the hill, we stand in need of encouragement. So temperance handles the things where our, our body and our mind along with our body is tempted to like go out there and get more and all that, the pleasant things, right? And courage helps us deal with the painful things, the things that we'd like to avoid. Um, going on a little bit further, Diogenes also tells us um, the kalon, the, the valuable in itself, the beautiful, has four types. And he uses the word kosmion there, orderly, we can translate it. And, and he, you know, this is clearly for him a synonym for the temperate because he uses sophrosune, temperance, just after that. Um, I've brought up this passage a number of times from Diogenes Laertes, uh, Book 7, Chapter 126. If a person has virtue, they can figure out and do what ought to be done. And so they can establish kind of rules for themselves or guidelines for themselves. And these are the, the poietea, the things that are to be done. And these include what should be chosen, uh, which have to do with wisdom, those which should be endured, which have to do with courage, those which should be distributed, which have to do with justice, and then those which have to be, as we translate it, stayed. The Greek is ameneteia, restrained is another way of thinking about it. And so when we do things steadily, ameneteikos in Greek, um, um, Diogenes also distinguishes This is something stoic virtue is not just itself, it includes some sub virtues, 
And you think of it as a, like a bucket that, that contains a number of different things. He only talks about two, but these are both very interesting terms. Eutoxia and uh, cosmiotes. So eutoxia, toxis is ordering, arranging, right? And a temperate person isn't just self-restrained by denying themselves pleasures or holding themselves back or, you know, um, making themselves not have a piece of cake or something like that. It has to do with arrangement. It has to do with priorities. It has to do with structure. Um, cosmiotes also, you know, this comes from the word cosmos, right? Which means not just like the universe, but it also means order <clears throat> and beauty structure. And so you can see these are these are connected with each other. To be a temperate person is not just to be a self-denier, it's to be an arranger, a prudent arranger. Now, when we look at um, Arius Didymus, and Arius Didymus gives us these wonderful breakdowns of the virtues that don't include every single thing the Stoics thought about it, but in, it, it, they're great starting points. He actually distinguishes um, four different components of temperance. And two of these are the ones that, that Diogenes has already mentioned, right? So let's start with the first one, eutoxia. What is eutoxia? What does that mean? So Arius Didymus tells us that it is knowledge of when something must be done and in what sequence and overall of the order of actions. Now, the, the, in what sequence? What Literally, what after what? T, meta, T in Greek. And the, the last one, the overall, the order of actions, this is a really interesting phrase. In Greek, it's kai katholu in, in general, right? Uh, tes toxeos ton toxeon. So remember how I mentioned tox, you know, toxis, toxeos is ordering? This is the order of orders. That's part of what eutoxia or orderliness um, has, to, has to do. Looks like we have an unstable connection, it is saying here. Uh, so let's give it just a minute until uh, we reconnect. Uh, there we go. It looks like we had an unstable connection moment for a minute. Let me restate what I just said in case anybody didn't get it. So um, the order of actions is actually a translation of the order of orderings, a meta-ordering. That's what eutoxia is. That's part of temperance. Now, the next one, cosmiototes, it's translated as propriety. This is a little bit more simple. Knowledge of suitable and unsuitable motions, literally motions, uh, kinesion. Um, and the, the Greek word there is prepusin, kai eprepon. Um, so, you know, what is, what is befitting, what is right for the occasion. Um, uh, yeah, no, it's kosmiotes in the Greek. Um, but so this is, this is a key component as well. Uh, and then we have something that I think a lot of people would typically associate with uh, moderation, temperance, self-control, enkratea, uh, literally self-control, self-mastery, right? And this is also uh, mentioned by Diogenes. And now this is a really interesting one. Knowledge which does not overstep the bounds of what has come to light in accordance with correct reasoning. Right, so there's a lot of moving parts there. Right, so let's let's break this down. Does not overstep the bounds. Literally, doesn't go further than it should. Right, on upper baton, by known as to walk or to step. Hooper is over, and on upper would be to like go go further beyond. So it doesn't go beyond. Okay, that's that sounds like the temperance that we all know and love, doesn't it? Um, but it doesn't overstep what. So he says it doesn't overstep the bounds of, now it's translating what has come to light, literally what has appeared, phanenton. Very important because, you know, fantasiae plays such a major, major role in Stoic uh, discussions. Fantasiae are what you translate as appearances or impressions, also imaginations. So, you know, the Stoics think that we we have to use fantasiae rightly, and this is part of how we do it. 
Now here, the third component to this, ton kata ton orthon logon, right? So orthon logon is right reason, you know, straight reason, literally. So it's not just reasoning, because our reasonings can be full of BS, right? We can reason how I should have the fifth piece of cake or eat all the ice cream or cheat on my wife and, you know, go, go, you know, be with this woman over here or sleep in all day, right? We can reason those sorts of things. Orthos logos, right reasoning says, no, 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 no. That's, that's a rationalization, not a correct reasoning. So, and kratea self-control is dependent on actually thinking through what you ought to do. It's not as if it gives a rule once and for all. I mean, there are some rules. Don't cheat on your wife ever. There's never going to be a good reason for that. Um, but maybe sometime you should have the fifth piece of cake, right? If you're at a cake eating contest, maybe then you, you abrogate that rule, right? Now, there's a fourth that I, it's actually third in the list, but I, I made it fourth because I just wanted to um, close off this little part by talking about it. Eidomosune. Now, if you know your Greek, you know that eidos means shame or a sense of modesty. And this is often translated eidomosune as modesty. I want to point out, too, that Epictetus thinks that this is important, too, but he uses a slightly different term. Um, actually a couple different terms at different points. So um, what is this? This is knowledge which is able to as a diet as a, a area as now that's a weird way of saying things, isn't it? Knowledge which is able to correct reproach. you um, uh, orthu sogo. Now this eulabetike, this is connected to another Stoic term, <clears throat> which means caution, eulabea, right? So it's not just about avoidance. It's about being cautious. It's about taking care. Taking care not to be criticized, but it's not about being criticized per se. It's about being correctly criticized. Once again, we see that word orthos in there. So if you think to yourself, you know, here, here's a good example. Um, well, what would Socrates or what would Zeno or what would Epictetus say about my behavior here? They're correct reproachers, right? What would, um, any pick any celebrity you want, or what would my neighbor down the hall say about it? They might not be correct reproachers. You, you have to, you know, figure out how you would guide yourself to not be reproached by the people who actually count, the people who know what's bad and what's good. So... Temperance has got a lot of a lot of stuff to it, doesn't it? So far, um, we're actually getting a little bit over time, so I might I might just skip over some of the Masonius stuff. Um, actually, I'll just reference Lecture Six. He talks about training, and he tells us there's training for the soul alone, and training for the the soul and the body. And he says we use the training common to both of these when we discipline ourselves to cold, heat, th thirst, hunger, meager rations as pleasures and patience under suffering. And now notice the connection between, or the split between temperance and courage again, right? For by these things and others like them, the body is strengthened and becomes capable of enduring hardship, sturdy and ready for any task. The soul too is strengthened since it's trained for courage by patience under hardship and for self-control by abstinence from pleasures, right? And so then he says, uh, training which is peculiar to the soul consists in seeing, the first of all, that the proofs pertaining to apparent goods and not being real goods are always ready at hand and long avoiding things which only seem evil uh, and in not pursuing any of the things that would seem only good. So there's two components there, right? Knowledge of what is good and what's evil, practice in doing that. And then he says, by doing that, we become courageous and temperate, right? So very important stuff there. Um, I also want to bring up Cicero. And if, you've, if you haven't read On Duties, you really do want to check that out because that is Cicero giving you Stoic ethics with some, you know, Roman culture stuff mixed in. And he's got a whole section on temperance or moderation in book one. Interestingly, where do you think he would begin? 
he starts with talking about building houses and people right? So this actually ties in with something that Aristotle had talked about in terms of um, magnificence, how we use our wealth. And Cicero actually uses that term in here. He's sucking magnificence under the virtue of temperance. He also tells us that there's three things that are important for a course of action if we want to be virtuous. One is that the impulse, the appetitus, the Latin version of the Greek epithumia, should obey reason. So reason, giving the right amount of care for the value of object, not getting super worked up over stuff that's trivial, um, realizing that stuff that's important, we need to give importance to. The dignity of a decent person. I'm translating liberalis in that way rather than as gentleman to give it a bit more broad sense to it. And he says that the best way we can do this is to observe propriety. Decus. Decus means like, you know, what is appropriate. Um, you know, when we talk about decoration, by the way, that comes from decus, right? And a lot of really in, in uh, Cicero's idea. He makes a distinction between, because um, he talks about, the, he uses the Greek term eutoxia, right? He makes a distinction between translating that as just moderation, modestia, and then what he calls orderly conduct, ordinis conservatio, the, the preservation of order, which we can also, he says, call modestia. And he tells us that this is a science or knowledge, scientia, of doing the right thing at the right time. And he tells us, now this, this actually will answer some of the questions that are coming up. Everything in our life should balance and harmonize. It's not just a matter of appetites, oh, having another unstable connection. Not sure what's going on with the internets here, uh, unfortunately, but let's take a little pause until we can be sure that uh, things are, are coming through. Um, <clears throat> Boy, I don't know what's going on with, with, with this, but the internet gods seem to be uh, unhappy with how things are going. Um, so in the meantime, while well, it says that we're waiting till we try reconnecting, uh, which could be on YouTube's end, could be on my end, could be who knows what. Um, there's a lot of people asking questions, by the way, about um, uh, terminology. Um, you can get the books and 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 check that out. This is a you know, this is a long pause right here. I'm not sure what is going on with the internet. Are, are people hearing me? If if you can weigh in and uh, say yes, I'm hearing you fine. That would be awesome. If not, then we'll have to pick up where we're missing out on stuff. Um, not quite sure what's going on with the. Uh, the modem here on, on this end. Okay, so Mark says in and out, but hearing most of it. Well, that's not that's not good because that means the recording is not hearing uh, things properly either. Um, Clifford says loud and clear. All right, well let's let's continue on, and uh, maybe YouTube is um, wrong about the connection being unstable who knows you know you never know with these platforms so let's let's talk more about cicero um cicero says everything in our life should balance and harmonize and the latin for that is this beautiful phrase in vita omnia sint opta inter se et convenientia so everything should be adapted opta between itself right um, and um, everything should coincide, everything should harmonize, convenientia, coming together, literally, everything should be able to come together within our life. So it's not just a matter of restraint. It's not just a matter of not doing things, you know. Uh, there's a whole bunch of, of, you could call them little readjustments that have to take place. Another thing that Cicero tells us that I think is very interesting is that we should be leery of violating social norms just because we appeal to examples like Socrates or Aristippus. We're not necessarily Socrates, right? So just because something was okay for Socrates to, to break or, or violate 
that doesn't mean that it's necessarily okay for us. We have to exercise prudence in order to be temperate. And he actually tells us that we should reject the system of the cynics entirely. Why? Because it erodes what he calls moral sensibility or vericundia in the Latin. Um, the last passage that I wanted to pick out was, was Seneca's On the Happy Life. And I'm just going to actually uh, go through this rather quickly so we can start answering some of these questions. Um, happy is the man that eats only for hunger and drinks only for thirst, that stands on his own legs and lives by reason, not by example, and provides for use and necessity, not for ostentation and pomp. Let us curb our appetites, encourage virtue, and rather be beholden to ourselves for riches than to fortune. For when a person draws themselves into a narrow compass, they have the least mark on at them. Let my bed be plain and clean and my clothes too, my meat without much expense or many waiters, and neither a burden to um, my purse nor my body, nor to go out the same way it came in, throwing up, right? Problem with the Romans. That which is too little for luxury is abundantly enough for nature. So this is a, quite a, a nice, um, you know, passage to, to think about temperance in. And it also shows why we ought to be temperate. It gives us a kind of freedom. And that's, that's a very important thing for the Stoic. So let's take some of these uh, questions and comments. Um, Massacre says, do you think to achieve temperance, one can or should supplement the Stoics' account of temperance with other philosophers? Uh, how to achieve it? Heidegger's being in the world, if so, with who? So Heidegger is going to be totally useless for you on this. Um, being in the world just means being in the world. There's nothing intrinsically temperate about that. And many people's way of being in the world is actually tied up with idle chatter or stuff like that. So put Heidegger out of your mind. And what I would say in response to the first question is this. First, learn what the Stoics actually have to say about temperance and work it through to its end. That means spending a lot of time with the classic Stoic texts and spending a lot of time practicing this. Then worry about whether you need to supplement it because you don't know what they offer until you've really gone through it. You know, So an hour, a day, a month probably isn't enough to, to make that, that call. You probably need to devote quite a lot of time before you're actually going to reach the limits of what the Stoics have to offer. And you can say the same thing about the Aristotelians, the same thing about the Platonists, and you know, there, there's, there's a long Platonic tradition, and the same about um, even the Epicureans, I would say. Um, let's see. Mark Smith says, what would Dr. Sadler say? I am not the Stoic sage, and I am not a particularly virtuous guy, so I should not be the person to provide the criterion for uh, right criticism, you could say, right? Uh, Massacre says, first time hearing of this Didymus fellow. Well, I mean, that's a sign that you want to start studying this stuff more. Um, if you've been in any of these other sessions, we have cited Arius Didymus a number of times, and you'll see me in my my writings on Stoicism bring him up quite often because he's a quite interest quite important text. Uh, Clifford says, "Is temperance more about control of oneself or balance?" Neither. It's it's about a whole bunch of things as we've looked at so far. It's not more about one than about the other. It's a complex set of uh, sub virtues that all kind of reinforce each other. So. There isn't really a more here. Kitten Mellon, can you list the names of the texts you mentioned, especially in reference to the soul? Yeah, I mean, I, I did this at the top of the hour. Um, Arius Didymus' Epitome of Stoic Ethics, Diogenes Laertes, uh, Lives of the Philosophers, Book 7, The Life of Zeno, and I've done so throughout the thing. Seneca's On the Happy Life, um, Cicero on Duties, um, Musonius Rufus's Lectures, and uh, I think that's pretty much it for the ones that we have referenced in this one. Well, Seneca's letters, you know, so those are all of those. Um, let's see here. 
Kitten melon. So why are courage and temperance separate? Because they're handling different things. You know, courage has to do with how we deal with pains. And as you know, if you've looked at the previous session, a whole bunch of other things as well. Perseverance, dealing with fear. Uh, temperance has to do with reigning in desires with arrangement of, of things so that they, they fit in with each other. Each of the Stoic virtues has its own area that it's working with. And this is something that you can say about any virtue ethics. You know, take, for example, Aristotle's virtue ethics, which does not just use the four cardinal virtues, but, you know, breaks it down in a different way. Why does he have, you know, say, 10 different virtues that are being discussed in books three and four of the Nicomachean Ethics, because each one deals with a different subject area. If they dealt with the same thing and they had the same things to say about it, you would blend them together and they'd be the same thing. So anytime that you see um, a real virtue ethics, as opposed to the schlocky stuff that people try to sell out there, um, as virtue ethics, or they just name a bunch of stuff off. Anytime you see a real virtue ethics, you should look at the virtues that they, they distinguish. And also you could say this about the vices. How are the vices different? Well, they orient the, the human person differently in relation to the subject matters. Um, let's see here. Saxon, uh, I may have asked you before about the book Character, Strengths, and Virtues, a handbook by classification by Martin Seligman and Christopher Peterson. I don't trust Seligman. I don't trust the positive psychology stuff. Um, so, you know, I, I've dealt with positive psychology people and life coaches, and I'm pretty leery of the self-reporting aspect of what they work on. So, you know, I'm not I'm not a big fan of, of Seligman. Um you, you know, if it helped you a lot, great. Um, I if, if we're like playing around with psychologists, I would say I prefer Daniel Goleman, who's probably a lot more Aristotelian in his approach, you know. Um, Kitten Mellon, what to do if you fail at being temperate? Get, get your butt up and figure out what you did wrong and start fixing it. <laughs> I mean, same thing for any moral failure, right? Um, for the Stoics, understanding what's going on with yourself is really important. You you don't want to just like, um, you know, it, it's not Stoic to just keep repeating the same thing. You have to think. You have to apply your, your mind so that you can um, figure out where you're going wrong. Start looking at your assumptions. I mean, you notice that with this discussion of uh, temperance, there's an awful lot of cognitive aspects to it, right? Mark says advertising seems a uh, purpose to incite that grasping of desire you mentioned. Do you think that advertising and consumer culture is fun fundamentally antagonistic towards temperate con customers? Yes, that, that's completely correct. Um, and this is one of the main criticisms that has been made of advertising for a very long time. Interestingly, in business ethics, it tends less to be framed in terms of temperance, which is a virtue ethics approach, and much more in terms of deontology. It, it gets framed much more in terms of um, autonomy, interfering with the autonomy of the decision maker by provoking their desires. You know, I mean, a prime example of this. <clears throat> I remember seeing when, when we were watching the you know last NFL football season, all of these advertisements for getting into crypto with celebrities. And I was like, oh, this is bad. You know, this is not going to be good um, because there's all these people out here who clearly make bad decisions because we've been, you know, seeing other advertisements pitched to them for betting online or stuff like that. And, you know, now they're pitching crypto as something that like you can't afford not to get in on. And you know, so what is that appealing to? Desire in the form of greed fear, fear of being left out of something. Um, you know, perhaps there's also the sort of fear of like not appearing like you understand how this, this crazy stuff works. And, you know, that's, that's a prime example. Um, 
of people being suckered into things. And, you know, the thing that makes people the most vulnerable is when they think that, oh, no, no, I'm too smart to be taken in by the con, <laughs> you know, and and advertisers love um, customers like that, that think that they're way smarter than they are. And in the stoic sense, not just, you know, like cognitive intelligence, but better having better habits, right? All right. Um, Clifford, so then temperance is using control of oneself to maintain or find balance. That's a thing that it is. It's a whole bunch of things, as I've said. I would, I would very much advise against trying to reduce temperance down to a single phrase. The whole purpose of this thing was to unpack for you how many different aspects temperance has, but that is certainly part of it. And the using control of oneself, yeah, the Stoics think that we... Um, do have the capacity to rework our thoughts about things and our habits and our volitions. So if you want to become temperate, you have to actually come to know yourself and know yourself as the messed up thing that you are so that you can start using that messed up thing that you are to work on it and make yourself <clears throat> less messed up. Um, uh, Saxon says, uh, never read anything else by Seligman. The book is like a car repair manual or things are laid out in a different way than their typical presentations to philosophy. Yeah, I don't doubt that because Seligman uh, has got his own shtick going, you could say. Uh, Mustafa, I've been following you for nearly a decade. Wish to discover this channel of yours long ago. Okay, so um, you must have been following other stuff because the channel is the main way I think people know me. Christian, thanks for making this series of videos. I learned a lot. I'm working through some of the works you've recommended so far. Just finished Diogenes Laertes last week and really enjoyed it. Well, that's great. Yeah. And, and you know, interestingly, coincidentally, we are still going through Diogenes Laertes, the life of Zeno, the summary of, of Stoic doctrine in the MKE, that's Milwaukee, Stoic Fellowship, uh, month by month. Um, all right. Rick says temperance now looks much broader and subtle. That's right. Yeah. Thanks to your explanation, the cognitive aspects are particularly interesting. Yeah. And each of these, here's one of the things I want to say. So the Stoics don't, in the discussions of this, give us like checklists or um, lots and lots of practices with worksheets or stuff like that. But we could develop that sort of thing. I think you, I think a person could develop something like a robust stoic virtue ethics developmental curriculum. It's interesting that nobody's really doing this in a, as far as I can tell, systematic way. There's lots and lots of people out there marketing, like, you know, become your best stoic and stuff like that, but it's all kind of slipshod and much of it doesn't have a lot of connection to um, the actual texts. There's a lot of like glomming things onto each other, like saying, you know, you've all seen the Stoic Compass bullshit chart where it's like, you know, the Epictetus's three disciplines, which by the way, that's just Epictetus. That's not a, that's not a like across the board Stoic thing. That's just Epictetus. And Epictetus actually has a different three disciplines and Seneca has three different disciplines too in ethics. So we should be very, very leery accepting, uh, even if Pierre Adot is in favor, we should be very leery of accepting that. And then those three things, things tie in with the four virtues. Bullshit. Those sort of schematic approaches. We actually talked about this at, at Stoicon in a panel. That's for suckers. That's not real stoicism. That's like somebody made a, a nice image that they could use. And it's, it's going to be detrimental to people who, um, you know, think that that is, um, where we're, where we're going, you know, in terms of development. So it'd be kind of cool to, to develop some sort of real curriculum like this. Um, Stephen says it would be worth noting. There's a great joy and strength. And this is very, very important. Very good point. Great joy and strength, maybe even inspiration and in being temperate, which Stoic would discuss this the most. Seneca. Seneca discusses this plenty. I mean, I already brought up, you know, some of the passages in which he does from On the Happy Life. Um, he talks about this in his letters. Epictetus talks about this as well. You know, these positive aspects of like being in control of yourself. Yeah, it feels good not to be prey 
to your own desires, not to be powerless in front of them. Um, that's that's really quite important. Um, all right, Saxon's making another book recommendation. Uh, Cialdani's Influence the Psychology of Persuasion, wrote it to help regular people protect themselves from marketers. Um, yeah, okay, uh, that's, that's good. Mark says, you mentioned the relevance of temperance to intoxicants. Could what we've discussed be brought to bear in helping out substance abusers and addicts? Is addiction an issue of, te of temperance or something more? So that's a great question. And this actually ties in with a broader question that comes up in terms of stoicism. Like I saw somebody in a stoic group posting just yesterday, can stoicism help me overcome my severe depression? And the answer is no, because it's not designed to do that kind of work. Um, it's not about overcoming it. It would be, it can help you deal with it, right? But you're still going to be a depressed person and maybe there's chemical imbalances or stuff like that. And with addiction, you know, we know that some, some substances are, are physically addicting. They, they mess up your brain where you want to get that stuff. And some of them are um, habit forming in a more psychological way, you know, like, um, you know, take marijuana, for example, not really physically addicting, but boy, do potheads love to smoke pot, you know, and some of them can't do without it, right? Um, and so, um, I think what we have to be careful of is first of all, drawing a really strict line between, and this is, goes to quantum astrologers thing. Stoicism is not a lifestyle attitude, it's rigorous system of philosophy. If, if you have in mind a lifestyle attitude, that's a totally different thing than actual stoicism. Can virtue ethics help us deal with things like addictions or trauma or, um, you know, other things that are that are really psychologically significant in our life? Yes, they can certainly help us with that. They are not by themselves the be all and end all that will take care of everything any more than like, you know, when people get religious and spiritual counseling and they're like, God's going to help me with my addiction. God will help you part way or the religious teachings or whatever, but you also need to see an addiction counselor or, you know, go to 12 steps or something like that. These things can work in common with each other, not perfect harmony, but you can use them as different, uh, um, you could say, sets of tools to, to really help yourself out. Um the same thing, by the way, goes not just for Stoicism, but also for Aristotelian philosophy. There is a wonderful, wonderful article out there by Leslie Cosman called On Properly Being Affected, which you can find anthologized in uh, a number of different, you know, collections on, of essays on Aristotle, including Amelie Rorty's collection, uh, uh, Essays on Aristotle's uh, Ethics, in which Cosman says, that what Aristotle provides us with is something that's really quite helpful, but it would need to be supplemented with some of what spiritual direction provides and some of what depth psychology provides. And when you do that sort of thing, you get something much more powerful. I mean, if you think about the contributions that Stoicism made to Albert Ellis's rational emotive behavior therapy, you can see something kind of like that, right? CBT, by the way, um, you know, in, in the hands of people like uh, Tim LeBon and, and, and uh, Donald Robertson, who are, you know, very versed in Stoic philosophy, very connected to Stoic philosophy, the average CBD person, not quite so these days. So um, Enzo says, I'm late to the chat. So pardon my question is regular basic as a person recently inter interested in philosophy. Where should one begin with the Stoics? I have an entire video out there that you can Google. Uh, self-directed study Stoics, right? And put that into Google and you'll have a video that breaks these things down for you. Um, Christian is offering advice on that, but I'm, again, there's a whole video. I also have a, a piece that I wrote recently, Stoic uh, Reading Suggestions, which tells you why you should begin with these particular three works uh, and then move on to the next three works and stuff like that. I should probably put that into the video description going forth. I should mention another thing too. Um, so now that we've done these, these five Stoic Sundays 
and talked about the virtues. I think there's still more stuff to be plumbed in terms of the Stoic conception of the virtue, but we'll probably uh, leave that off. I do have something coming up on a different platform than YouTube. There's a link to it right there in the um, uh, video description about a um, free course, free 90-minute session that I'm offering on Light Hall. And it's specifically about five Stoic practices from Epictetus's and Caridian. We did a previous one on Light Hall with five Stoic practices. We're doing another one with five more Stoic practices. So if you want to do some real hands-on stuff um, and get you know questions answered about the end Caridian, which is which is a good place to start. It is one of my uh, uh, own places where I start beginners. Um, you might want to sign up for that same same time on a Sunday. And uh, Light Hall looks to be very promising as a place to offer um, these sorts of engagements. So, all right, Mark says, my final question seems to me the term sufrosune has a rich etymology. I particularly like Plato's dialogue, the Karma Days, which, which is trying to define sufrosune, not successfully, as is the case. But uh, could you maybe speak about a possible link to phronesis. Um, so, you know, phron is in both of them. I mean, clearly for both Plato and the Stoics, temperance, so phrosune, is connected with phronesis, practical wisdom. You know, practical wisdom helps guide phronesis, or helps guide sophrosune, or, or moderation. Um, you know, for the Stoics and for for Plato, and they're both pretty Socratic in this way, I think you can say that um, wisdom or practical wisdom is, you know, sort of the, 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 the first among equals of the virtues, right? So it's, it's, it's performing this absolutely important guiding role. Um, and you probably can't have much temperance. You could probably have some temperance, but you can't have much temperance without also developing practical wisdom. And to go back to some of the questions about, you know, where where courage and temperance, you, 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 you really need both of them so that you can handle the kind of life situations that you're going to run into. Um, justice, you know, you could say maybe justice helps to dictate some, some, some of the limits that, that um, uh, temperance has to observe. So for example, if, um, if it's okay for you to eat a certain amount most of the time and you keep yourself to that amount, but now you're in a situation where you're stuck in a bomb shelter with a bunch of other people and you have sufficient foodstuffs and they don't, you probably need to eat less and distribute more, right? So, so temperance would, would look a little bit different depending on the situation and, and justice might have something to do with that, right? So, all right, well, this is a good place to leave off. Hopefully this has been useful. I'm you know, sorry about the internet interruptions that we've had, which are really unfortunate. Um, still says it's unstable. Hopefully everybody's hearing okay, and hopefully the recording of this is okay. Uh, we'll take one more question here. My, my friend thinks Stoics are more close to deontology than Aristotle's virtue ethics. I disagreed with him. What are your thoughts? Totally depends on how you understand deontology. Totally on, depends on how you understand Aristotle's virtue ethics. Totally depends on, you know, which Stoics you're looking at. So there isn't a cut and dried answer for, for that. Um, Aristotle has some deontological aspects to his own philosophy that you can find when you look at Nicomachean ethics, particularly book four, I think. Or is it book two where he says some things are just wrong, like adultery? You know, you can't have the right amount of adultering, you know, <laughs> screwing around on your wife or anything like that. So, all right. Well, I will see all of you hopefully uh, next week for the thing which isn't in YouTube, but on Light Hall, the link to which is below. And hopefully this has been useful for you. And um, here we go. 